everybody. I'm um, Barbara Warnock from the Wiener Holocaust Library in central London in the UK and I'm really delighted to welcome you all here tonight for this very exciting um, event with Rachel Carotti and Stephen D. Smith um, in, to discuss the publication of Rachel's forthcoming work, We Share the Same Sky, based on her award-winning podcast of the same name. So we're so thrilled to be doing this event tonight in conjunction with the Ark Synagogue um, in Northwest London. Um, and just to say a very, very brief few words to start off with, um, we're recording this um, event tonight and there will be a link to share at a future date. So you can keep an eye on the Wiener Library social media and YouTube channel to find out about that. Um, you can use closed captioning if you want um, captioning, you can switch that on and off um, on your um, Zoom account if you want to use that. Um, so just to say very briefly about the Wiener Holocaust Library, because um, we've got quite an international audience, I think, tonight, which is really exciting. Um, but some of you may not be aware of us. So we're the world's oldest collection of material on the Nazi era and the Holocaust. We're based in um, central London in Russell Square near the British um, Museum. And we have a busy program of exhibition events and other things. So if people are ever in London, then please come and um, visit or look for what we've got available online. Um, so that is all I wanted to kind of say by wor word of introduction. Um, we are going to be hearing tonight from, um, from the author, um, <coughs> Rachel Crotty, um, and she'll be in conversation with um, Stephen D. Smith tonight, who um, worked with her um, on her podcast series. So um, Stephen D. Smith is Finchy Verbet <coughs> ah, pronounce it wrong. Better be endowed executive director of USC Shoah Foundation. He is a junk professor of religion at the University of Southern Carol California, and he is a theologian by training. Smith founded the UK Holocaust Centre in England and co-founded the Aegis Trust for the Prevention of Crimes Against Humanity and Genocide. He was project director responsible for the creation of the Kigali Genocide Memorial Centre in Rwanda and trustee of the South African Holocaust and Genocide Foundation. So as I say, Stephen will be in conversation tonight with Rachel, but I'm just going to hand over to senior rabbi at the Art Synagogue, who are doing this event in conjunction with the Wiener Holocaust Library, Aaron Goldstein, for more of an introduction. Very simply, the link to our synagogue was one word, and that was Colin, um, the town where Rachel's grandmother was born. And our synagogue has a Torah scroll from that town, which is most endeared to so many in our community. In fact, there was a bit of a boy reading from it today. It's one of the most important parts of our community and really pulls at our hearts. So just to hear that word drew me in. And then when I was drawn into listening to Rachel's podcast, um, I was generally down at the allotment and I was in tears both of joy and in sadness as well. And I know that you're going to enjoy hearing an excerpt of Rachel reading. She's one of those incredibly talented people. I won't go through all the academic and intellectual uh, bio, but she's an author, a photographer, an educator, a producer, and a very nice human being as I'm beginning to find out. So let's hand over to Stephen and to Rachel and enjoy this evening. Well, thank you, uh, Rabbi Goldstein. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Barbara, for the invitation. Um, we're going to, this evening, be in conversation, Rachel. Um, usually on our podcast, we're interviewing other people, but I get the pleasure to interview you this evening, which is just fantastic. Before I do that, I want to hand over to you um, to read an excerpt, just to set the tone for us, of your new book coming out on August the 17th. So everybody get on Amazon when you've heard this and uh, order your pre or pre order your copy. Uh, Rachel is going to start our evening by reading an excerpt from We Share the Same Sky. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here with me today. It's such a pleasure to virtually be across, across the big ocean um, and with all of you from all around the world. Um, and thank you, Stephen, um, Barbara, and Aaron for hosting and for being a part of this with me. Um, so as Stephen said, today I'm going to start off 
by reading an ex excerpt from We Share the Same Sky. I just got the hard covers a couple of days ago, so it's still very exciting to hold. Um, and then Stephen and I are gonna chat a bit. So um, this section essentially just sets the stage for what the past now 12 years of my life have been in um, embarking on a long journey into my grandmother's war story. On October, on October 8th, 2010, Mati passed away. We all call my grandmother Mati. There were no tubes or sterile walls. There were no doctors dictating visiting hours or nurses checking her vitals. Hannah died at home, a place that she had fought so many times over to create for herself. Her body lay peacefully. It was the first time I touched a dead body, but I didn't cry. My memory is in black and white, I remember her skin being cold and soft. I took her hand and kissed it. Surrounding her were her pictures, her writings, and the delicate pages that proved her past. It was everything that I, unknowingly at that time, will come to wrap my world around. In the years after her death, I uncovered the most beautiful archive of her life. It wasn't a hidden archive or a secret one. It was just what she had left behind. It was everything she had told me, curated and edited. There were preserved albums and hundreds of photographs dating back to the 1920s. There were letters waiting to be translated, journals, diaries, deportation, and immigration papers. There were pieces of creative writing from various stages of her life, some marked up with line edits. The archive was seemingly endless. Every time I thought I had found the last box, I discovered another. There were repeated stories, some written at age 14 and others at age 80. There were anecdotes and memories that contradicted each other, bringing the question of memory into all of her stories. There were childhood report cards and souvenirs from her cross-country travels. There were confessions of love, secrets intended to stay private, and flashbacks never intended to be understood. She had written about being a daughter, a sister, a granddaughter, and a cousin a friend, a student, and a dedicated member of her youth group. She was a strong-willed teen, a refugee, and an orphan. She was a survivor and a victim, a wanderer and someone who dreamed of home. She was a hopeful immigrant and a forced emigrant. She was an urban dweller and a farmer. She was a pioneer and a storyteller. She was a Czech child, a stateless teen, and an American wife. She was a traveler, an explorer, a teacher, and a student. She spoke six languages. She was a divorcee to one and a reignited flame to another. And for other men, she was the one who got away. She was a bride, a mother, and a grandmother, a young person searching for her future and an elderly person watching her grandchildren search for theirs. I became obsessed with this material, adopting it as my own and taking it with me when I moved back to Boston after graduating from college. My methods of preserving my grandmother's story would have appalled any professional archivist. These were documents and photographs that should have been handled in a clean environment and stored in boxes that were waterproof and fire resistant and let in no light. These were delicate, worn pieces of paper. And yet here I was sitting on my bedroom floor, moving them from one pile to another and storing them in manila folders with little to no protection. I digitized and organized it all plucking it from the past and placing it into my present. I learned my grandmother's handwriting. She used the same shaky cursive to capture her, to caption her photographs as she did to write letters to friends while titles were always written in block capitals. I scanned every photograph. I retyped every diary. Every word went from her fingertips to my own. I paid close attention to the names and places I found in the archive. These details were found on the backs of photographs, on official documents, within the pages of journals, and on stamped letters sent from one country to another. I listed the names chronologically and took note of how she had gotten from one place to another and which train station she had stopped at. When my grandmother started telling me her story, she said she had felt like she was going on a big adventure. That's what her archive felt like as well. I began buying books about World War II and the Holocaust. 
It is the most well-documented genocide from the side of the perpetrators and the victims. I learned the basic facts quickly. World War II began on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland from the West. A few weeks after that, the Soviet Union invaded from the East. The persecution of the Jews started far before that. I taught myself about the roots of anti-Semitism and the rise of the Nazis. It felt like a puzzle. The history books helped me understand my grandmother's story and my grandmother's story helped me understand the history books. During these early years of obsession, I shared an apartment in Boston with two friends. I was stringing my rent together by working various jobs, primarily through photography, international travel programs and teaching. My future felt like it was on the edge of exciting, but not yet burdened. My roommates and I hung white lights around the living room and lit candles while listening to Bob Marley, Kendrick Lamar and Rudimental. We played games, made friends with each other's friends and went to concerts. It was that time in life when we were all making bold decisions for ourselves, but not the kind that had to do with kids and marriage. We were all just figuring it out. Barack Obama was president and change was happening. Life was moving and love was flowing. With each new photograph I scanned or diary entry I transcribed, I became more and more committed to my grandmother's story. It had been almost four years since Hannah had died and I'd spent too many years buried in her story to not let it take me somewhere. So I decided I would literally follow in her footprints. I would live in every country she had lived in. I would travel the way she had. I would track down all the characters from her journals, all the names listed in her letters and documents. And most importantly, I would try to find the people who saved her life. In her diary, my grandmother called the Holocaust an incomprehensible black page of history. I wanted to know what happens when you turn the page. Well, thank you, Rachel. And beautifully written. And I can tell everybody on this call that uh, this, e this evening that uh, it just goes on and on like that for hundreds of pages. And this uh, beautiful tale is so well told. So uh, congratulations. I feel like I've lived this with you for a little while now, Rachel, um, since you told me you were writing. And so congratulations on getting it to this point. Thank you. Um, so, Rachel, I want to. I just want to go back. How how long actually have you been? In how long has this book been in the making? Um, Seems like a long time. Yeah. No. I, when I was twenty, <laughs> so I'm now in my early thirties. It's been about a dozen years. Um, going on a baker's dozen, and yeah. I mean, when I started it, I was like a very discontent college student who didn't really know what I was doing with my life. But I was really into photojournalism, and I was like really set on being a photojournalist and. Um, every young journalist storyteller is told, like, pick a story and start a blog. Blog were the things at that point, which makes me feel a little bit old now. Um, but uh, yeah, and so I chose my grandmother's story and it, you know, it started off slow and it started off with a, a storytelling times with her before she passed away. And so she would tell me her story and we would get together. And then I discovered this archive upon her death and was doing that for four years, as you just heard. And then I went on the road, which I thought was going to be one year of travel. Um, and now here we are <laughs> many years later. And it's, the story has transformed as my life has transformed. And so this book is kind of the culmination of a certain piece of my life with this story. And we'll see what happens next. So we started just a few moments ago with the death of your grandmother, Hannah de Bova. But tell us about her in life. I mean, who was Hannah Dubova. I think my mom is on this call, so it's always fun to answer this question in front of her. Um, my grandmother, as I remember her, was like the most outrageous woman. She actually wore a pin that said outrageous, an outrageous older woman or something of that sort. Um, and she was just the most filled with life, joyful woman. Um, there was a period in my teenage years where that joy was not really a part of her a part of herself and a, some, a lot of survivor's guilt came over. And I do write about that in the book because that was really my first introduction to her grief, which honestly, I think until it took me into my twenties to understand what I was witnessing at that time. Uh, but that's not how I remember her. I remember her as being the woman she dyed her hair green for my bat mitzvah party. <laughs> and she would, you know, take me to go see arts in the park, even though I was like a, you know, a pain of a child and didn't want to do that. And she just wanted to expose all of us to, theater and culture and she, you know, cooked Czech food, but was just, you know, 
in the year 2000, she threw herself a 50 years in America party and she just was vivacious um, completely. And I will say she, she remains that way even after reading all of her diaries, she's become even more vivacious of a person. You know, when you, when you get into the book and we see your sort of journey, she was so, also so eloquently uh, brought to us through the podcast we share the same sky last year you know we feel like we've been on this journey with you for all these years and it was always meant to be that but did you have any sense when you set out to document her story you know a decade ago that you would be on this this journey for so long or was it just a short project you intended to do and then move on I, if anybody had told me I was going into like, you know, a decade long project, which is really what this book documents is 10 years of doing this work. Um, I would have never have signed up for that because that's really intimidating to think of working on a story for so long. Um, so no, but it became very clear, particularly around 2014, 2015, 2016, there was a lot of change happening in the world politically. Uh, there was also a lot of change happening in my life, um, both celebratory and from a tragic point of view. And so as things for me started to change, as the world started to change, as I was growing into adulthood and seeing the world in a much more complex layered way, my grandmother's story became really different. So I start off, started off as kind of, you know, I think I am still kind of naive, but you know, as a very naive 20 year old, you know, looking into my grandmother's story. Um, and then it became more and more complex as time went on. And so that's what kept me engaged in it is that the story kept changing as the years went on. And that to me is why I've always felt like this is a story of memory because the memories have shifted in many ways. And even when I would read her diaries, like certain things now stand out for me. Um, as you know, someone who's well more into adulthood than I was in my early twenties, and so that that's what you know, it's what's what keeps it interesting and um, what keeps it relevant. Also, I get this sense that um, you sort of I, I mentioned that you've been on this journey for ten years, but you literally travelled to places, right? You you got on trains and played, I mean, the Greyhound bus for God, you know, whatever whatever it is that you were doing. Why did it matter to literally go to those places and live where she lived and? you know, ride the same trains and get on the same buses and be in the same barns. What was that about? Well, I think it started in the fact that I was pursuing this as a photography project. And so I think if, had I started pursuing this as a writer, I would have said, oh, I can write a book about my grandmother's life staying on my bedroom floor in Boston, no problem. Cause I, I mean, the wealth of material she left behind was, I mean, incredible. And I still, I feel like I haven't actually gone through all of it, um, which is kind of fun, but also kind of scary that I'll find things that, you know, change, change the story I wish I wrote in. Um, but so really it was having a camera and feeling like, well, I can't do a photography project unless I see these places. So that was the first motivator. Um, but then as I got into it, you know, if I was sitting on a train that was going from Prague through Germany, where I was going to go and get on a boat to take myself to Denmark, which was mimicking her journey. And I was trying to do it in a speedy fashion. And, you know, very, uh, the words read so differently to me. So suddenly I was reading a piece of her creative writing that she wrote about that trip out of Czechoslovakia in 1939, which was, you know, a rescue mission for Jewish teens that she was really lucky to be able to get out. Um, and all those words had different resonance as you're listening to the train chug along and as you're you know looking out the landscape and as you're making the transfer in Berlin and she's writing about you know what it was like for her transfer in Berlin and you know some of the young people she was fleeing with you know had, were stripped and searched by Nazis and all, all of these things like felt so much more visceral when I was on the road and but also the 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 piece that contrasted it all also felt very visceral where nobody was looking at my passport, nobody cared who I was. And that I think was a really important emotion to feel. Um, and then I was, as I was getting further into the story and you know, I thought I was gonna go and do all this stuff once and I did it multiple times many years over because then as the refugee crisis broke out around 2015, 2016, suddenly there were passport checks in Europe. And so it was just interesting that I was traveling at this pivotal time in Europe where a lot of things were changing as well. Um, and that's what had me keep going back was I felt like I couldn't responsibly tell this story without understanding like the cultural landscape to the best of my ability. And that required being there. 
So. You know, your grandmother was in Denmark um, late, late as the Holocaust unfolded, as, as we know from the, the podcast that you shared. Why is the story of the rescue of the Danish Jews so important to understand? And what was it like for you to be there and, and learn in that place what had happened to, to rescue the Jews of Denmark, which obviously your grandmother wasn't the Danish Jew, but she was in Denmark. Um, so it's sort of, it's a very interesting connection that you have then. Yeah, and so just to give a bit of background, so my grandmother was able to get out of Czechoslovakia in 1939 as part of a rescue mission through the Zionist Youth Movement in collaboration with the Danish government, as well as an organization called the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So there were a few hundred, the numbers kind of differ depending on what research you look at, but a few hundred Czech Jewish teens between the ages of 14 and 16 were taken to Denmark to be put on foster farms, essentially to learn agricultural skills with the intention of going on to Palestine. And most of the children did not go on to Palestine. So for those early years of the war, my grandmother every six months was being moved to a different foster farm and essentially working for stay, working for her room and board. Um, and a big part of my research was actually moving in with the descendants of one of those families. And they become very big characters in both the book as well as the podcast. Um, so then in 19, Denmark was a relatively light occupation during the war for a number of reasons, which are very interesting in themselves, which I'm going to skip over for the sake of time right now. Um, and then in 1943, you know, there was a plan to deport the Danish Jews and it was leaked. Um, actually, the, the leak was through a German officer, which is very interesting in its own right. If you're looking at stories of upstanders and people using their privilege to, um, you know, to do something good and help people. And essentially, in the matter of a few weeks, 95% uh, of the Jewish population of Denmark was rescued from grassroots up. It was not, you know, not, not from the government down um, and were able to be illegally ferried to Sweden. And my grandmother was a part of that. And I think one of the really important distinctions about this period of history is that the Danes were very um, committed to their constitution, which essentially stated that nobody should be, receive preferential treatment, which is why the Jews, you know, should, should have been protected. But what's very important is that they didn't differentiate between who was a Danish Jew and who was a Jew living in Denmark. And I think that that's a really important lesson in history about protecting your neighbor um, and, and the way that neighbors show up for you. And, you know, one, one of the, the lines that was said to me by, by a very important character in the book was that, you know, even staying silent was an act of resistance at that time. And so really everybody contributed. So I, I personally find this to be one of the most important stories of World War II. Of course, I have a sentimental attachment to it, but I think particularly in an age as we are right now, where we're all trying to figure out how do we contribute in a very positive way to society and how do we help one another, um, Denmark plays a very, it's a very good example for us to look at of like what can go right in a time when everything is going wrong. So rather than take a formal Q&A at the end, I did say, suggest in the chat that if anybody wants to ask a question as we go, I'll, I'll field the questions to Rachel. Uh, we get to talk to, to each other more than we probably even want to at this point, Rachel, with our podcast and all the things that we do. So I don't need to spend too much time talking with you. I would love to take, make sure that I've got everyone else's questions in, even though I do have a hundred questions for you, believe me. Um, but I have a question here from Omar and he's asking about the psychological impact on yourself through this journey that you took. Um, and, you know, was it a psychological challenge to go through this and to, to go through her journey again? And if so, how did you handle it? Um, and uh, how do you perceive that your book will be received by younger generations, presumably like yourself? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting. And actually, in, in, in the podcast, I get into this, it becomes, and same in the book, but the podcast is a good space to, to take on this question of intergenerational trauma and how it's passed from one generation to the next, because there is an exploration of how the second generation, the two Gs, um, you know, have carried a lot of their parents' trauma, which in effect has protected a lot of us 3G. And kind of my like very simplistic <laughs> take on it is that I feel a lot of responsibility and that feels like my psychological burden. I don't feel as much of the trauma necessarily. I definitely have inherited fear, um, particularly at a time when anti-Semitism is rising and particularly at a time where, you know, I'm, I'm a 
public speaker, you know, it, it passes through your brain when you, when you inundate yourself with all of these stories every single day, like your imagination becomes a very vivid place for what could happen. So there's definitely the fear factor of, you know, both loving my identity, but also being a bit scared of it because of my history. Um, but then the other side is like feeling a lot of responsibility. Like my grandmother was cared for. She was saved by the kindness of strangers. Her entire family was murdered. Um, most of her parents and brother were killed at Sobibor, which I do go to and, and talk about in the book. Um, but she was saved because of the kindness of strangers. And I've always looked at her story as an uplifting one. And, you know, you know, the period of history is very dark when someone with that story is seen as an uplifting story. Um, but I hope, you know, the people who helped her, and you get this through all the people I meet in the book, they don't know what happens to her. And I think that that is a really important lesson of just like, you can do good deeds and you can help people and you can be kind to people and you're not going to see the impact of it. Um, but it'll be passed from one generation to the next. So in that sense, there's a lot of responsibility of be a good person, do the right thing, treat people kindly, and you don't need to see, you know, what the result of that is, just do it. Um, in terms of how it's received, I hope it's received well by young people. It's intentionally not very long, so it doesn't intimidate uh, too many young people. I've gotten to work a lot in education and taking this story into the classroom. And when I produced We Share the Same Sky podcast, which was with Show It Foundation, and um, you know, the first time Stephen and I got to collaborate, um, I, you know, every episode comes with a lesson plan. It's intended to be used in the classroom, and so I really was trying to blend this space of narrative storytelling that is compelling and relatable, also with with some education in there. And so hopefully young people read. I, I really hope it's a book that a grandmother and a granddaughter can read or a grandfather and grandson, whoever. And at least there could be an intergenerational conversation sparked. Um, and so that's my big hope with this book. And I, I hope I wrote it in a way that's compelling for all generations. Sounds a little bit corny to say this, but uh, you and I met on Instagram, if you remember a few years ago. Um, I don't even know how I ended up on your Instagram account, but I just took one look at it and went, wow, who, who is this person um, that's writing so eloquently about being the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor? Obviously, in my work at the Shoah Foundation, I mean, spent wonderful times with Holocaust survivors themselves and their children and their grandchildren. So I'm fairly used to um, the sorts of things that uh, you know families say. Um, and there's a certain, certain eloquence about what you were trying to portray through what was initially an Instagram account. But what were the steps that led you to say, okay, I'm now gonna turn that into a podcast and why podcasting as a medium uh, to tell this story before writing the book? Sure. Well, the podcast is the best accident that's ever happened in my life, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, Stephen and I met on Instagram, which is like the best social media story considering neither of us are like kings and queens of social media. Um, and I think that then you and I met at Yad Vashem when we were both there for a conference at one point. And, and then I came out to LA to meet some of the Shoah Foundation folks and started exploring like, you know, what could we do with this story? And just around that time, I had done gotten to work collaboratively on a piece with WBUR, which is Boston's NPR station. And they, this wonderful audio producer, Erica Lance, produced this three-part multimedia series that was three episodes of a podcast about my friendship and working relationship with a woman named Julie Lindahl, who's the granddaughter of an SS officer. And that was the first time that I had heard my story told by anyone else first. This was in 2017. Um, and also that I had heard it done in podcast form in audio storytelling. And like I said, I came into this work and into this field through my interest in photojournalism. Um, always you know, wanted to write a book that was always in the back of my mind. Um, but around this time I was doing this, this thing with NPR, Stephen, when you and I connected, you said to me, is your grandmother in Show Foundation's archive and the Visual History Archive? And I was like, probably. And this is where I feel like a terrible journalist because I should have asked myself this question many years before. And suddenly you email me a four and a half hour interview with my grandmother. And the one thing I felt like I failed to do with my grandmother myself when I interviewed her was I didn't record audio. Um, I had only written. And, you know, part of me thinks that was a nice thing is that, you know, I get to reflect on it differently without, you know, 
hearing verbatim what was said. Um, but having this four and a half hour audiovisual testimony was a complete game changer in how I could think about this story. Um, in many ways, you know, she was saying in that interview many of the things she said to me, but sometimes she said it a little bit differently. And that's been one of the things that's been so fascinating to me about finding all these diaries and photo albums and different testimonies. Um, plus the story she told me is that I'm just fascinated by the way that memory changes over time and the way that memory impacts all of us and the next generation. And so that was just another installment. And then, and then I spent a year, a year isolating in my little apartment uh, in 2019, producing this podcast and it came out. And um, in many ways, I don't think I would have known what to really write in the book if I hadn't gone through working on the podcast because the audio was such a visceral experience for myself and getting to include all these other characters' voices that you meet throughout the book. Oh, you're muted. Debbie, Debbie mm -hmm. and Jonathan are gonna put you on the spot here. Hi, Mom, Janet, how are you? Uh, the question is, did your mother and family support your research and writing? Were they comfortable with you bringing this family history into the public domain? I will, we can ask you after this Zoom is over, Janet, what you really think, but Rachel. Um, did they support it? Yes. Yeah, they totally did. So both my parents are really into family history, um, which is, you know, I, I would say I'm like kind of the, I think, perfect combination of both of them. I mean, but, you know, maybe my mom would argue differently, but uh, my dad is really into his family history and my mom very much carried her family history. It's kind of known in our family and even my grandmother says it in her testimony that my mom carried it differently than the other siblings. So that certainly got passed down, but I think it was also really helpful because as I got interested in all of this stuff, I had this support where we would talk about it and it was interesting. My mom and I did, you know, early on, there were certain things she didn't want me to read out of my grandmother's diaries, which I understand. And I had to, for some, for a few years, had to make some compelling arguments about how I would read it as a journalist and not as a granddaughter and it wouldn't change. And, um, you know, I think that is part of the challenge of going into your family history is that thing that it can change the way that you view people that you love. Um, but overall, very, very supportive. And my mom and I have actually gone back to Colleen together. Um, and that was a really moving experience for us. And we've been to Denmark together and Czechoslovakia, or Czech Republic. And when uh, the podcast came out, she came with me to Denmark and met many of the characters uh, in the book who, you know, feel like family to me now. Uh, so yeah, very supportive. Very uh, I think Maybe Madine's question is uh, is similar in a way. It's she's asking, is there anything that's not in the book um, that either you wish could have been included? And I'm going to add to that, or is not in there for some reason? Yes, hi Madine. Um, I yes, absolutely. Okay, so the document on my computer that holds all the words that I wrote that got cut out of the book is longer than the book itself. So <laughs> yes, for sure, part of that is just for narrative flow and not distracting from the point and certain that's just the very hard thing about being a storyteller same for the podcast um, and hopefully those writings will get turned into essays at some point or you know I use them in education and then yeah there are absolutely things that I felt it was not appropriate to put in because I think one of I feel a very deep responsibility to my grandmother's story and part of that is a very challenging space of like, what do I actually even have the right to tell? Like when people write their diaries, they don't, they write them for themselves and not to be shared. And so it is a big kind of moral question of just like, am I even allowed to share any of this? And so, you know, I, I certainly knew that anything that she put into her testimonies that were recorded with Shoah Foundation or any other groups felt appropriate for me to say out loud because she knew she was recording that for a public space. Um, and then there were certain elements of her personal life I just didn't feel was appropriate to tell. It wasn't my right to tell, but also it wasn't important for the story. And I think that's a big part of it as a storyteller. You know, it's like, what, what, what is going to matter to the narrative at the end of the day? And even something that's like a really like, you know, like spicy detail, like might be really interesting, but is it really adding to the point of the book? And so th those were a combination of personal and professional choices I had to make. Um, uh, I've got a couple of questions here. One, one's from Caroline, which is, did you meet anybody on your journey who gave you further information that filled in the gaps of things that you didn't know before you went? 
on that journey. Let's start with that one. Yeah. Okay. So the people I met on this journey have all become family to me, which is honestly the best thing is the greatest gift of all of this. I mean, I am, I, I feel so lucky to have a career where I was able to put this story into a podcast and into a book and, and do all these creative efforts with it and get my grandmother's story out there. But the greatest gift I got were the people that the story introduced me to. And so there are individuals in Denmark, like I said earlier, I moved in with the granddaughter of one of the women who took care of my grandmother. And um, I originally went to live with them for five weeks on their farm in Denmark. And then for like three, three-ish years after that, I was on their farm all the time. <laughs> Luckily, when you have a farm, you have a lot of space. So they were very welcoming. And that was incredibly special because I had gone out at that period with this like very possessive attitude about this book where it's like my story and my history and everything was kind of in the the possessive space and then I met these families that were passing down my grandmother's story because it was a good story in their family that they helped save somebody they helped save a young Jewish woman during the holocaust and so realizing that there was this family in this other country who spoke another language who came from another religion who had a different historical perspective and experience was passing down my family story as part of their family story it was very humbling and it became this much more like collaborative storytelling space for all of us and experience space. Um, another character you meet in the book is Rabbi Bent Melchior, who is the former chief rabbi of Denmark, if anyone's familiar with him. And he actually was on the same boat as my grandmother in 1943 when they fled um, Denmark. And so he has become a very, very important part of this story. And I've adopted him as my grandfather. And that is one of the best relationships I've gotten because I didn't have any grandparents left. And so to feel like I have that relationship in my life is really special. And he was able to absolutely fill in some details of that evening because there's an epic story of how they get lost at sea and they make it to Sweden. And he was able to introduce me to fishermen, a uh, fishing family in Sweden who was part of getting that boat to shore um, and part of that rescue mission. And so suddenly there was this like whole part of the story that opened up that I had no idea I could even ever touch. Like I hadn't even thought about trying to find these people. And that's the beauty of this type of like documentary storytelling is like you meet one person who says, oh, you should meet this person, you should meet this person. Um, and that's really the way this whole project has worked. Um, and I think that goes back to like why I had to go to Europe. Like a lot of these connections just never would have been made from my bedroom. They, you know, they, I needed to be there and I needed to keep showing up over and over again um, to build that trust with people as well and to build those relationships. So uh, a couple of questions around sort of the contemporary relevance of your story, Rachel. Hey, Barbara Winton. Nice to see you. Nice to be on with you. Um, Barbara's father, Sir Nicholas Winton, was one of the uh, founders of and the instigators of the kinder transport. Um, I miss Barbara going to the pub with your dad. I tried, I tried to take his testimony for the Show Foundation twice. It was a hopeless, hopeless task because all he wanted to do was go to the pub and have fish and chips, <laughs> which we did. <laughs> and as Barbara will remember, I had to go back twice to, to get his testimony because he was much more into the socializing than actually talking about the past. Um, but um, Barbara's asking a very interesting question about Denmark and, and Britain, both of whom rescued Jews during that period. Uh, the kinder transports obviously brought over 10,000 children to, the, to Britain, um, and Denmark saved that, you know, 7,000. Uh, or, uh, Jews um, uh, in this most daring, daring escape uh, plan that was instigated. And yeah, Barbara's making the point that both of those countries today are really, you know, struggling in terms of how they treat refugees um, and are not welcoming and have all sorts of you know, problems in terms of discrimination and racism. And she's just asking the question, so how does that play out um, in your experience in, in the book? And how do you, how do you figure that. And I'll, I'll just add to that the question also being asked by Carolyn is that, um, that you said that there's a contemporary relevance in your grandmother's story. Can you just tell us more about what you think its meaning is for today? I think they go together quite well with those two questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for those questions. So like I said, I started traveling full-time for this story in 2014, the fall of 2014. 
So by the time I had returned to the United States about a year later, the refugee crisis was at the forefront of international media. And following my grandmother's story, it was like very, like I was like, my life felt like sometimes like my head was spinning off my body because the newspaper headlines felt like it was mimicking this history. And, you know, I'm very, very careful about the compare and contrast of history, I, you know, and, and what is the line of how we talk about it. But I mean, it, it was very clear that there were some themes that were emerging that were very similar. So as I mentioned just before, I had been introduced to these uh, this fishing family in Southern Sweden, right on the shore who I had gone to in 2015, I think March, 2015 was when I first met them. And we went and talked about history and it was this beautiful thing because this boy was six years old and he saw this refugee boat out in the water and it was his father who went and, and brought them to shore. And the refugees didn't know if they had made it to Sweden and had they made it anywhere else, they certainly um, would have been at a high risk to be killed on the spot if not deported. And um, at that point, things felt kind of like this very like linear story of history of like, oh, like, look how nice it is now. Then I get home and the refugee crisis is starting to emerge. And during that visit um, in southern Sweden, they had taken me to this home that my grandmother stayed in the very first night where all the refugees stayed before they were quarantined um, at a larger center. And so one of the reasons I felt like I had to go back to Europe was I to, couldn't ignore the fact that suddenly Scandinavia was this like very highly coveted place for all of these refugees and migrants who were trying to get to a better life. So I went back to this place in Southern Sweden in the summer of 2016, so a year later. And I asked this family to take me back to this house because I hadn't liked my photographs and I wanted to take a few more pictures of it. And I'm starting to take photographs of that house. And suddenly this like woman comes out and she's like, you know, you can't take pictures, you can't take pictures. And I was like, oh, well, why can't, you know, why can't I take pictures? And young refugees were living there again. And that was the moment that like kind of everything stopped being linear and started feeling very cyclical in a way. And I really had to stop and, and sit with that for a while because suddenly it wasn't really just a story about my grandmother. It was this story about, the evolving relevance of history and you know what do we want to do with our family stories is it just that you want to learn what they are or do you want to put action to these stories and that's the responsibility piece coming in so that put me on this path of documenting young refugees in Scandinavia and so I was very fortunate to get connected to some folks who let me into their homes and let me into their lives to photograph young people arriving in Scandinavia um, without their parents came by boat um, and their battle. Um, and, you know, in Sweden, it was, you know, being with them as their battle for family reunification, because that's why a lot of people were going to Sweden, because historically they were, you know, unifying, um, reuniting families. And those policies were being kicked back. And in Denmark, you're watching policies becoming a bit more anti-immigrant. You're seeing all over the world at that time, you know, the presidential, presidential elections here were starting to kick off and Brexit was happening. And like all of these things were going on that were very anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, very xenophobic at their core in many ways. And it completely changed the point of learning about my family history. And so I do, I address that in the book and I address it in the podcast. The podcast has an entire episode about a Syrian man living in Copenhagen, you know, and I'm not a political analyst in any way. I try kind of hard to, to keep it from a narrative space and, you know, not a um, policy space because I don't, I don't think that's my expertise. Um, but I think it's something to not be ignored. And I feel very, very strongly about that, that I can't talk about this history without talking about what it means in our present day landscape. Uh, one of the things that really struck me, Rachel, in our very first conversation is about the whole change in your life um, that happened unexpectedly um, and the way in which you have talked openly about your widowhood. Um, uh, and I want to, first of all, I want to thank you because I, I deal with, I guess I, get, I deal with death every day in my job, but it's usually uh, the deaths of people I don't know um, and uh, people are not close to, um, and on mass because of genocide. So I, I consider myself good at talking about issues of death, but you actually have taught me um, to confront it in a completely different way. And I have to say, in the last few years since getting to know you, I talk to people who are experiencing 
death in a completely different way as a result of listening to you and, and learning from you. Um, but I think that the question I wanted to ask about was, was um, how has this entire journey changed you, not only through the unexpected events that you went through, but how you have coped with both the past and the present together? Uh, just share a little bit about that for us. Sure. So, um, yeah, so in 2016, around this time when, you know, the world was changing around me and I had already spent, you know, seven years at that point inside my grandmother's story, um, I was married and then soon widowed very quickly to, I was married to a, a wonderful man named Sergio, who I met at Hebrew University. We were study abroad students together and he was a, a guy from Poland. And so when I was traveling in Europe, he was my home base there. And then he immigrated here and very quickly was widowed after that. And that story is told in the book and in the podcast. And that was one of the events in my life that completely changed how I saw my grandmother's story. And I remember sitting there in the hospital and he died from an undiagnosed heart disease. So he had a heart attack at 28 years old. And I remember sitting there in the hospital and I, I still feel this like intense guilt about this feeling, but all I could do was think about my grandmother because I felt this like really heavy weight of like, what, who did I think I was to be, to try to narrate my grandmother's story of grief? Like, why do I think that I had any right to touch that story? Because I didn't really know grief. I mean, I, my grandmother had passed away. I lost grandparents. I, as a young kid, I, you know, lost friends in a tragic bus accident, but like, I was so young at that point, I didn't really know what it meant. Um, and so my husband's death was really the first time that it was like, you know, my like grief was became a narrator in my life um and yeah and that and then I felt like I had to go again and go for my you know retrace my own steps acknowledging the fact that grief was a big part of it because I always kind of had this idea that like well my grandmother didn't witness death so that was part of her story being like a little bit gentler and then I started like rereading her diaries and seeing all these spaces between the words and all of these silences that suddenly held a lot more depth and sadness and fear and longing and loneliness that I just couldn't have picked up before. And so a lot of what this book ended up being, and I had written a whole draft of this book before my husband passed away. And then the story completely changed. And what I found, it's been almost five years now, this fall will be five years. And what I found is that because of my grandmother, I feel very empowered in my loss. Like going back into all of her words, going back into her history, into like the, the, the depths of the grief, as well as the things that she celebrated was a huge lesson in how to be empowered by my own life story, um, how to sit in the sadness of my own life story. And so in that way, family history, again, changed its purpose. So now it was helping me have perspective on the state of the world and what my role I would like for it to be in that, who I want to be in what's happening in the world around me, but also who do I want to be to myself and how do I want to view my own life story? And so, you know, I, I think that family history is really special in that way where it's this huge source of strength that belongs only to us and we can grow with it and change with it. Um, and so this, this book tells that story very much so. I uh, just took a final question here from the audience. Uh, this is from Sharon is asking, were, were you influenced by other writers who've been writing in sort of similar genre like uh, Ariana Newman and Hadley Freeman and books like that who've been, you know, are also inheriting these histories. I, I remember sitting with Ariana when she was uh, starting writing her book in London and wow, what a story. Uh, and then it's just so delighted when this book showed up. Um, also kind of this quest, you know, to find and rediscover family history. But did those books influence you or were you just completely on your own journey doing your own thing? Oh no, absolutely. It's not only, the, you know, influence, maybe depending what day and, and what aspect of it, um, but encouraging, it would be like my biggest word because this work is so lonely. Like it is really a lonely space to dig into your family history because it's yours and yours alone and like how you interpret it. And if any of my other cousins, there's seven us grandchildren from Hannah, everyone would write a different book for sure, right? So this is this is my perspective. It's, it's my, my version of her story. Um, but all of those other writers have been 
hugely like encouraging in the conversations I've gotten to have with them, the support. You know, I remember I mentioned Julie Lindahl earlier who wrote a book called Pendulum. And when she and I met each other, it was the first time that I had met anybody else who had spent like at that point, seven, eight, nine years traveling the world, trying to figure out their own family story and their own place within the world and all of that. And it like, I remember when we met each other, it was like, oh my God, I'm not alone. Like, we're not crazy. This is like an okay thing to be doing because it's hard to explain to people what you're trying to do. I mean, now it makes sense because there's a book and a podcast, but for majority of all these years, I was trying to tell people that I was like on this journey to follow my grandmother's story without anything like to attach to it. And that was kind of hard to comprehend. Um, I will say there's one book from my childhood that's hugely influential to me to this day, and that's The Giver. And if anybody's familiar, it's Lois Lowry. It's a young adult novel. Um, and still to this day, I pick up that book because it's all about, it's like a fictional, you know, utopian, dystopian world. I'm not sure which one it would be considered as, but uh, where there's this this man, this elderly man in the community who passes down memories to this young boy. And so that book has always been kind of like a, a, a piece of a piece of my life from the time I was a child. And so now as an adult, I look back on what I was interested in as a child. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's, <laughs> that makes sense why I like the work that I do and why I like working with testimony. And, you know, Stephen, when you and I have our podcast, The Memory Generation, that's what we're doing is like thinking about all of these, you know, testimonies and stories and what do they mean to us? today. And I just feel grateful I've gotten to do that with my own family history. It's been a great gift that my grandmother gave me by leaving her memories for me to attach myself to. So tell us about the memory generation. What's all that about? Yeah, well, so after producing We Share the Same Sky, Steve and I got into conversation um, about, oh my God, we should have a podcast together. And so finally this year, we kicked that off in April was our first episode. We just released our fourth episode and it's a monthly podcast uh, that Stephen and I co-host and it's inspired by the Visual History Archive at Shoa Foundation. And every episode uh, digs into one of their testimonies and we tell the story of a survivor or a witness and discuss and have conversations with really incredibly wonderful, intelligent, artistic human beings who are in this field of inheriting memory and what does it mean? And so Stephen and I get to talk constantly and I always get to have him record for me and then play with our voices and put it together as a podcast. Yeah, so I've put the uh, link for the Memory Generation podcast in the chat. Please follow that. And I also put earlier the link for uh, We Share the Same Sky. And if you've not listened to that, you have about four weeks before Rachel's book comes out, which means you can uh, binge on the podcast and then be ready for the book uh, on August the 17th. Uh, and also, I think Bob, Bob put in the uh, link for um, the book. You can order, pre-order on Amazon. Um, so uh, it looks like Tamar Barnett is giving you your next project here. I have seen some of the photographs that you have taken along the way because they appear in your websites and so forth. But Tamar was interested to know what's going to happen to all the photos that you took on your photo journalist journey. Oh, that's like the biggest question of my life right now. I have over 100,000 photographs in my archive, which is a daunting number, incredibly intimidating to myself. And I took most of them, so I did it to myself. Um, I, you know, I originally thought I was going to make a photo book and I started it and have started and now I'm kind of intimidated by the number of photographs I have, but hopefully one day a photo book, I daydream of an exhibit, you know, some where I can bring all my grandmother's artifacts and everything into it. Um, but I will say that those photographs have been used. I mean, when I was writing the podcast and the book, those pictures were what I wrote from. And so anytime I needed to describe a place or jog my memory and what I found is that those photographs were how I experienced what I was doing at the time and they're my own memories and so even though they haven't been published as much although I put up put them up on Instagram and folks can follow the Instagram account it's at share the same sky um I have to say they are they are the the photographs are the greatest inspiration for the writing so um and you know Hopefully there'll be a visual project along the way. So coming up next. Fantastic. <laughs> so, so that was the last question, but the rabbi obviously gets the final word on everything. Um, and so I think uh, Rabbi Aaron is suggesting a title for one of our podcasts because his question is, is there a difference between memory and lived memory? We can make that our final question before we pass back to Bob. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, yes, totally. And then there's the question of like, when does memory become its own lived memory in a way? And so one of one of the the ways I describe this book is, you know, the kind of uncovering how the retelling of family history becomes the history itself. Because in many ways, that's what the conversation has become between me and all of these characters you meet in the book is that, you know, we've created our new, whole new version of history by the experiences we've had retelling the story together. And that's been incredibly powerful. And as for the lived experiences, you know, I don't know, it's, it's a great question. So Stephen, I think we have a, a topic on our mind. I'm actually curious what you think about that, if I can turn it over. <laughs> oh, I think we should discuss that at length in our, in our future podcasts. Uh, I'm going to uh, say thank you to you, Rachel, for being on today, uh, for writing a wonderful book, which I've had the privilege of reading and uh, writing the forward for. and. Uh, and thank you for your wisdom beyond your years and your insight into not only a grandmother's story, but into human nature in so many profound ways. It's a pleasure to work with you and to spend time with you. And Rabbi Aaron and, and Barbara, thank you so much for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here with you um, this evening. I'm going to hand back, uh, I think, to one of you, perhaps to Barbara or to Aaron. Thank you so much indeed to both of you uh, for such an incredibly inspiring evening. Uh, what's wonderful is that there's people of lots of different generations here this evening as well and in lots of different spaces and experiences uh, and I'm sure that everybody will have taken something uh, away from this evening. Uh, one of the things that uh, I really take is uh, around third genera uh, generation responsibility and of course there is a specific narrative in terms of um, Shoah, uh, Survivor and third generation and at the same time, it's very, it's very inspiring to hear you talk about responsibility and therefore the responsibility that every third generation, which of course we all are um, in some shape or form, have both in terms of maintaining our family stories and histories. Uh, sometimes it's reclaiming it, sometimes it's finding it again. Uh, uh, sometimes it's a memory that you don't want to maintain as well, uh, which should be respected. Um, but how empowering it is and what a force for good in the world it can be as well. Um, thank you so much for the two of you. Uh, I can tell you, please go and listen to the podcast. Uh, please go and uh, listen to the latest version. I haven't heard the latest episode yet of Memory Generation. That's for the allotment later tomorrow morning. Um, but we'll, we'll be listening to the two of you and keenly following all of your work, which is so important in terms of good in the world. And a final thank you to the Vena Library for putting on such wonderful events. It's our honour as the Art Synagogue to be working with you and look forward to doing that in the future as well and bringing many more thoughtful evenings and thoughtful events to everybody. Thank you all so very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks, Erin, and um, good night to everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone.